Let's, uh, let's pray and we'll get into the Word. Father, thank You that we have a chance to come and we have a chance to read the Scripture and to talk about what it says. Help us to see it for what it says. Help us to not get bogged down in, um, in less important things. And help us to focus on Your Word and listen to what Your Spirit would teach us. Help us to see who we are and who we were created to be. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. So, uh, there was a movie 10 or 12 years ago I saw. It was not a great movie. It was not a bad movie. It was absolutely mediocre, which is why it stands out so prominently in my memory. No, it, it was called Vantage Point. It was just an everyday action-adventure, thriller kind of movie, right? Uh, but here's what was interesting about it. Here's really why it did stand out in my memory. Uh, it's a 90-minute movie, but it's not a 90-minute story, right? It is the same story. It is, it is the events of, tw of a 23-minute incident told again and again from a different perspective, from the perspective of different characters in the movie, right? And as, it, and as they replay the incident from another perspective, they reveal more details that are only available from that character's perspective. And then they'll show it again from this other character's perspective and reveal details that only, only are visible from that character's perspective. And so it really is about the vantage point from which you see the event happen is how you understand how the event unfolds. And that's that really is true of life. I mean, we can witness the same incident and come away with a very different story because of where we happen to be looking. And, and not even bringing in our own biases, just literally from our own vantage point, right? You might have a different story. And then when you bring in your own perspective, your own personal perspectives, it changes things even further. Well, that's a little bit like what our text is today. Um, so a few weeks ago we studied the creation account in Genesis 1. We did that over the, over the course of a couple of weeks. One week was, the, was all of creation up to the creation of man. And the next week we talked about the creation of man and, and what our purpose is and what we were created for. Well, today we're in chapter 2 of Genesis and we've got a different account of the same creation narrative. It's a repeat story. Which is why... I've, I've titled this origin story continued, right? Is because it, it, it's just a continuation of that, kind of. Um, it's the same creation narrative, but there's a different focus, right? There's a different perspective from which we see that story happen. The first account is chronological, and it's focused on the whole of creation, the day-by-day -day unfolding of God's creation. The second chapter of Genesis... Um, is not chronological, it's more of a logical or, or a literary account. And, it, and the focus is narrowed. It's not talking about the whole of creation story. It <laughs> focuses in on, it hones in on the story of the creation of man and, and talks in more detail about the creation of Adam and Eve. And so the chapter, by the way, and we'll, we'll read it in just a bit, Last week we talked about Sabbath, which was in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3. But chapter 2, verses 1 through 3 really aren't part of chapter 2. I mean, they, they are. But as a way of thinking, they go more with chapter 1. It was the seventh day of creation. Chapter 1 is the, the other days. And so it fits better there. When the Bible was written, there weren't chapters and verses, right? That came hundreds, even thousands of years later, depending on which book you're talking about. The, the chapter headings and the uh, the chapter breaks and the verse uh, numbers are purely a man-made ad addition to Scripture to help us be able to find stuff, basically. Um, think about if your Bible, as it was originally written, wouldn't have had any of that. All you would have had was the book distinctions, right? Now, now let's look up chapter 12 of something, right? It, it's just impossible almost. And so... So the books and the verses were, I mean the chapters and verses were added later. Chapter 2 really starts at verse 4. Like we really, as a thought, we're really starting it today. Um, and the very first words of this are 
this is the account of. And there's all of that is a single Hebrew word. Moses wrote this in Hebrew to the children of Israel, to the Israelite people, the Jewish people. And that's a single Hebrew word. And I don't speak Hebrew, but it's a single Hebrew word. This is the account of. And this happens ten more times in the book of Genesis. And it basically outlines the book of Genesis. It's a way, uh, it, it introduces new sections. It literally means this is the history of, or this is the story of, or this is the genealogy or the family of. And it starts with a, with a person or incident, and then it tells that story. And then Moses will come to a new one. This is the account of, and it'll tell who, and it'll tell their story and of their descendants. And this goes on and on throughout the book of Genesis. And uh, this uh, shows that the early chapters of Genesis, the creation account, are just as much history when it says, when it says this is the, the story of or according to, right? This is where it all begins. This this really helps emphasize to us that the creation narrative is just as much actual history as when we get to the story of Abraham and Isaac Jacob. When we read about Joseph toward the end of Genesis, we don't really question whether this is a historical thing, right? Because these are people and it's easy to think. It's easy to process that and to say, oh no, he's talking about Joseph and he's in Egypt and these are real people and it's a real place and we get that. But when creation, this is so, it's so huge and, and, and fantastic, right? It's, it's easy for us to try to play that off as some, some literary storytelling device that may or may not be history. Well, Moses tells us that it is history. He describes it the same way he does the rest of the book. Yeah, chapters 2, 3, and 4 are going to give the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. And that's taken from that passage. We learn from the outset that the history of earth, or our history, man's history, is tied together with the history of heaven. God created the heavens and the earth. He did this together. We find that our story and God's story are intertwined together. And that's an incredible thought. Let that sink in for just a minute. We have to see ourselves, if we're going to see ourselves accurately, we have to see ourselves as we relate to God and the rest of creation. Because apart from that, we don't really know who we are. We don't really know what our place is or what our purpose is. It's only when we see ourselves in the context of the rest of creation and our relationship with God that we have some sense of who we are. We'll read the text in just a moment. We're going to see three themes that we'll talk about uh, today. One of those is that we're created by God to live in relationship with Him. We're created by God to work for Him. And we're created by God to be morally accountable to him. Those are going to be the, the themes. There, there is a fourth theme in chapter 2. We're not going to do that today. We'll get there next week. And that is um, how God has provided this good institution of marriage and he's done that for our good. Um, let's, let's read in Genesis chapter 2. We're going to read starting in verse 4. Moses writes this. He says, This is the account of the heavens and the earth when they were created, when the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now no shrub had yet appeared on the earth, and no plant had yet sprung up. For the Lord God had not sent rain on the earth, and there was no one to work the ground. But streams came up from the earth, and watered the whole surface of the ground. Then the Lord formed a man from the dust of the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. Now the Lord God had planted a garden in the east, in Eden. And there he put the man he had formed. The Lord God made all kinds of trees grow out of the ground. Trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. In the middle of the garden were the tree of life and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river watering the garden flowed from Eden. From there it was separated into four headwaters. The name of the first is the, the Pishon. It winds through the entire land of Havilah, where there is gold. The gold of that land is good. 
aromatic resin, and onyx are also there. The name of the second river is the Gihon. It winds through the entire land of Cush. The name of the third river is the Tigris. It runs along the east side of Asher. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to work it and take care of it. And the Lord God commanded the man, You are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. And we're going to talk a little later, uh, just a tiny little bit about the trees, but that tree, those trees will come up again as we know and play a major role in the story uh, in the next chapter of Genesis. Let's talk about those three themes that we see uh, in, in, in this passage about that, that tell us more about who we are and what we're here for. That They're really about our origin story. The first of those themes is that God made us to live in relationship with Him. Now, where do we really see that in this passage? Here, Moses gives us several clues to this, but, um, but the first one is the frequent use of God's name. Now, think back to the first chapter of Genesis during as Moses writes about God creating the different aspects of creation, right? And God said, and God spoke, and God made, and God created, right? God, 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 God. That God is Elohim. In other words, that's God's title. It's all about His power, His comprehensive authority, right? This is a more formal name for who God is, but in chapter 2, Moses doesn't call him Elohim. He doesn't call him God. He uses this, this longer name. He calls him the Lord God. Now, if you'll notice in your Bibles, uh, it probably has the word Lord in all capital letters. Like the L is a little taller and the O-R-D are a little smaller, but they're still in capital letters. I don't really fully get how that practice developed, but I do know this. When you see Lord described that way, it is almost always talking about God's personal name. In the Old Testament, that means it was translated from the Hebrew word Yahweh, or, or we used to say Jehovah, right? Jehovah and Yahweh would be different versions of the same word, kind of like John and Juan are. And, and so Yahweh Elohim is what he says, and Yahweh Elohim did this, and Yahweh Elohim did this. Yahweh, and what he's doing, he's, he's, he's writing this. Remember, he's not a first-hand account of creation. He's writing thousands of years later to the Israelite people as they're getting ready to cross into the Promised Land. And they know him as Yahweh, the God who has delivered them, this personal God. When Moses, when Moses was called in the desert to go back to Egypt and deliver the people out, of slavery, and, and he said, who do I tell them has, has sent me? And we know that expression, right? Tell them I am, as I am who I am, right? That's Yahweh. Yahweh is I am. This is God's name. It's personal, right? This is, this is what people in a relationship with God would call him, Yahweh. But all in chapter 1, he has said over and over, Elohim has done this, Elohim has done that, this formal, powerful, comprehensive, full God. And so what he's doing now is he's connecting the dots for them. And he wants them to know that the God who brought you out of Egypt, the God who defeated Pharaoh, the God who opened up the Red Sea, the God who provided manna in the wilderness, the God who gave you water when there was no water, the God who led you by a pillar of fire and a cloud. The God that you have a relationship with, the God who gave you His covenant law, is the all-powerful Creator God of the universe. They are one and the same. And so He wants us to see that the Creator that created us, the Creator that created the world, the Creator that created Adam, is a God that desires to live in relationship with us. And, and He desires for us to want that relationship with Him. 
And He's wired us to need to be in relationship. Like we, we need relationships. We need people around us. And what that is, is that's a picture of the need we have for a relationship with God. Those, those human relationships won't fulfill that spiritual need, but they're a picture of that need, of that emptiness. When we don't have people around us, we feel that. We really feel the missing, that missing part. We feel that emptiness. And that's a picture of the emptiness that's in our soul, the emptiness that's in our spirit when we are not in relationship with our Creator, God. That's the first way that Moses tells us that he links those names together to tell Israel that their God, the God of the covenant, is the same God who desires to bless everybody who follows him and everybody who obeys him. The God of creation is the God of history and is the God of salvation. And he knows his people and he desires his people to know him. And another way Moses uh, points out or, or directs us to this idea that, that we're made to live in relationship with God is that um, he shows the, the care, the attention, the, the personal attention that God used in forming Adam and creating Adam. Now remember in chapter 1, he's created all these animals and he did it by the power of his word, right? The power of his will. He, he said, let there be, or he said, it says God may. I mean, it's just a matter of God causing it to happen. But when he prepared to make Adam... He certainly had the capacity to do that. But we get, and, and I think he did that. Don't get me wrong, right? I think it was just the power of his word, the power of his will. But there's a, there's a picture he paints. It tells us he did do that, but he did it in a special, caring, sort of hands-on, if that's a fair way to say that, way. It, he, he talks about uh, bringing the dirt together, right? The dust to create Adam. He, he, you get this idea, it's kind of like a potter who takes clay and molds it into a living being or a sculptor who takes clay and shapes it and forms it into just the masterpiece he's trying to create. Like He could have said, let there be Adam. And there was Adam. But he didn't. And, 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 and he talks in chapter 1 about the animals and giving them life and about, about, the, about the breath of life. But it's different, right? It doesn't say what he does in chapter 2, how, how he took this man that he had created him and, and, he, and he directly gave him the breath of life. He breathed into him the breath of life. Right? This is, there's care and attention in the words that are used. We are carefully designed by an intelligent God who, who loves and cares for His creation in incredible ways. But He didn't just um, create our physical bodies, right? We're made of dust. In that way, we're related to the animals, right? I mean, we're, we're created out of the nothingness that, he, that God started with. But we're different because we're made in the image of God. We received our life from God and we have personality and we have rationality and we have more moral capacities and and we are different because we can seek and we can have communion with God and the animals can't have that. I think it's interesting this idea. I think a lot of commentators over the years have read things into and maybe it's fair and maybe it's not. Maybe it's just maybe it just helps paint good pictures to help us understand things. So I don't want to beat up on the people who do this but uh, several commentators have written about how the fact that man was made from dust is meant to prevent pride in us, right? Because we're just made from dust. But at the same time that we were made by God in His image reminds us that while we should not have pride because we're made from dust, we have high value because we're made in God's image. And there's some tension there, but there's also some balance there that helps us keep a proper perspective of who we are and what we're worth. Um, J. Vernon McGee has said, we're made of dust, and dust that gets stuck on itself is called mud. The story was told of a little boy who came to his mother, and he said, Mom, is it, 
is it true we're made from dust that when we die that, that we'll go back to dust? And she said, yes, it, it is. And he said, well, I looked under my bed this morning and there's something either coming or going. So, it, it, it would be really easy for us to overvalue ourselves. It is. This is a human problem, right? Is the, the hubris, the but even from a biblical perspective, to to overplay being made in God's image such that we have an overinflated value of self. We we have to remind ourselves sometimes that we're made from dust. But if that's all we focus on it's easy to forget how special we are. I, I will tell you, I think, I think, and, and I've been careful as we've gone through the creation account, or I've tried to be careful. I am a, yeah, I've said this before, I'll say it again now, I'm a, I'm a young earth, literal, seven day, right? I'm, that's what I believe. Um, I won't dismiss fellowship with somebody who believes differently, uh, but, uh, but, I, but that's what I believe. I think one of the things that has really hurt our culture, our society, has been um, has been a teaching that says that we evolved from animal species over a period of time, millions or billions of years. And what that does is that doesn't allow us to see ourselves as created in God's image. I mean, I think that's one of the major flaws. I mean, we can we can talk about the technical problems with it, but but I think that's maybe one of its biggest flaws is it prevents us from seeing ourselves as being created in God's image like we were. Um, there is something that I see far too frequently that is so incredibly heartbreaking is young people, especially young adults, who in the midst of whatever problems they're suffering and whatever experiences they are in the midst of, do not have a high enough value, to see a high enough value in their own life that they take their own life. And this is reaching epidemic proportions. And sometimes it's it is often intentional, and sometimes it's unintentional. They value their life so lowly that they take undue risks, and that's the consequence. But so often it's intentional. Week after week after week, we see young adults primarily who have chosen to take their own life and I think if they saw themselves as valuable, as created in God's image, that would be a much harder step to take. God made a point of taking care and showing attention when He created us. We're not created like uh, the other creatures. Uh, another thing... Uh, that chapter 2 shows us about uh, God's desire to have a relationship with us is the care He took not only in the creation of man, but in preparing the earth for man. Preparing an environment for Adam and Eve and for us. Um, he, he supplied things that were missing so that uh, we have all that were needed, so that Adam had all he needed. Verse 5 listed some deficiencies. Verses 6 through 17 show God's supply. Next week we'll see verse 8 showed a deficiency, right? It's not good that man should be alone. And he spends the rest of that chapter describing God's supply for that problem, for that deficiency. Everything surrounding Adam pointed to God's goodness and God's graciousness and God's care and God's love for his people. There are a couple of areas, by the way, in this passage, super easy to get bogged down in. So I want to address them quickly and move on. Um, one of those has to do with the order of creation. right? So Genesis 1 lays out this happened on the first day, this happened on the second, etc., etc. But in chapter 2, 
it seems like there's a contradiction in the order things happen. But I would say that there's not. Remember chapter 2 is not meant to describe a chronological <laughs> word, a logical one. It talks about how the plants, how these plants were not created yet. And yet we know plants were created on day 3 and man was created on day 6. We're looking at a day 6 story and God's talking about creating plants. What's the deal? Well, I, I think he... Um, in, in chapter 2, he's not referring to all the plants. He's referring, I think, to specific plants, to cultivated plants, the shrub of the field, the plants of the field. I mean, he names some specific kind of context. These are, in my opinion, these are plants that were meant to be cultivated by Adam to provide food for Adam, right? And Adam doesn't exist yet in day 3 to cultivate these plants. And so... That's why he didn't create them until he created Adam. Man wasn't there to tend them. The garden wasn't complete yet. I, I think that's a pretty simple explanation, and it's I think it's reasonable. Uh, another has to do with the location of the garden. The full extent of the description we have that is definitive in Genesis 2 is that he planted a garden to the east in Eden. That's so incredibly vague, right? You would not believe the reams and reams and reams of resources trying to describe exactly where the Garden of Eden was and why. Here's what I've got to say. It doesn't matter, right? And this would be so easy to get bogged down into and pull, we can pull out charts and maps and we can locate. We know that the Tigris and Euphrates were real rivers. Um, and so we don't even know those other two rivers. Like, did do they exist today? Do they have a different name? Were they ever, what was? We don't know, and and we're not even absolutely certain about some of the boundaries he talks about. You know, this river was to the. We don't know exactly. Plus, I've got to believe. I've got to believe that between the time of Moses writing this and today, there has been some slight uh, topographical changes, right? I mean, the, the land probably does not look exactly like it did then. I think when Moses wrote this to the children of Israel, they understood more or less where the garden probably was. But again, I don't think that's the point Moses is making. I think there's, I think there's uh, uh, a couple of things he's trying to do. First, I think he wants us to know the garden was not a mythical place. It was a real geographic location. It was a real garden with real plants and real animals, etc., etc. By the way, I also think that he describes this river that's the, the head of these four rivers that flow out of there. Um, it wasn't God's intention for man to eat the fruit and fall into sin. It was his intention for him to, to continue to, I think, to continue to build out the garden. I think the intent was for the garden to keep growing along the paths of those rivers as population increased and as all of those things. Now a lot of this is speculation. This isn't, we don't know this for sure, but it certainly makes sense. The, the first thing is we want to know that the garden is real. The second thing is um, Moses is writing this to the children of Israel as they're about to cross in the promised land. They've been trekking across the barren, hot Sinai Peninsula desert. The idea that God would provide abundant provision for Adam before the fall was meant to give them hope of a future to come. It was a picture of the kingdom to come, of the promised land. Listen, that's a hope for us. The tree of life is mentioned again. It's a hope for the future for us, just like it was meant to be for the children of Israel. He created the earth as a beautiful place and He put us here to relate to Him in that place. The second thing, uh, the second big principle in here uh, about us being created by God is God made us to work for Him. Uh, a lot of people think about paradise. They think about luxury. They think about, you know, that that rest and relaxation, garden living. They think about paradise as a place. Maybe you lie in a hammock, you're under a palm tree, you have a, a beverage and a 
coconut shell or whatever, right? I mean, this is the picture of paradise. This is our culture has kind of fed us this image where we don't have to work and we don't have to lift a finger and everything happens for us. God planted a garden and He put Adam and Eve in charge of that garden and it said that they had a job to cultivate it and to keep it. Now this was before the fall. Sin has not entered the world and Adam is a farmer. Right? I don't know if you know farmers. Farmers work. They work hard. And Adam had a job that required hard work. Here's the lesson. right? Hard work is a good thing. That hurt a little bit just for the words to come out of my own mouth. Right? Like, nobody likes hard work. Right? But hard work is a some people like hard work, but that's certainly not normal, right? Hard work is a good thing, though. It's good for us. God designed us to work, and He designed us to be productive. God gave Adam a job. He assigned him the job of cultivating the garden. Remember, He also gave him a job of naming the animals, and that was more of a mental job, right? He gave Adam physical work, and He gave him mental work, right? He had he, It was a full-bodied kind of work experience. It was... It was legitimate work. There's an old Swedish proverb that says, God gives every bird his worm, but he does not throw it into the nest. God expects us to work. And that's not part of the sinful condition. That is not part of the fall. That is part of what it means to be created in the image of God. Even in paradise, Adam had to work for his food. Work is not part of the curse. The curse involved the difficulty of working against the curse. Adam had to, and God, God put the curse on the earth, and Adam had to work against that. He had to toil against that. Even though we work under the curse, there's value in working to provide for our needs. And it doesn't matter whether it's a what we think of as a white collar mental job or a blue collar work with your hands job. Both are legitimate, God-given forms of labor. Paul wrote about this in Colossians. He wrote this little two verses to slaves whose work was menial and whose work was difficult. And here's what Paul said. He said, whatever you do, work at it with all your heart as working for the Lord, not for human masters. Since you know that you will receive an inheritance from the Lord as a reward, it is the Lord Christ you are serving. And so whether a person is a janitor or a rocket scientist, right? Whether, whatever it is, wherever on the spectrum a person's work falls, God's given us work to do, and we can find satisfaction in that. I, I read a story I'll share. It's kind of funny. Uh, a few years before the fall of communism in Russia, uh, the story is told. There was a joke going around about two workmen had shovels and they're they're going down the street working. One worker would dig a hole every 20 feet down the street, and the second worker would come along behind him and fill up the hole. And um, and just on and on it went. And a man was watching them and he yelled at him, Comrades, what are you doing? You dig, you dig a hole, the other fellow fills it up, you're wasting the party's money. And he said, you don't understand. Usually we work with a third fellow, Mikhail. Uh, but he's home drunk today. I dig the hole, Mikhail sticks in the tree, and Dimitri puts the dirt back in the hole. Just because Mikhail is drunk doesn't mean that Dimitri and I have to stop working. <laughs> right? they, their work, though, was futile, right? It was useless. God didn't create us to engage in futile or engaged it or, or, or create us to engage in productive work. And there is satisfaction in doing that. Matthew Henry said this about Adam's work in the garden. While his hands were about the trees, his heart might be with his God. I think it's a beautiful sentiment of how we ought to view work. The third, the third thing I, I see in here, the theme that I see about our creation is God made us to be morally accountable to Him. He made us to be in a relationship with Him, and He made us to work for Him, but He made us to be morally accountable to Him. Verse 9 gives us the first hint of this test that Adam was going to be confronted with later, right? when it tells us that he planted in the center of the garden these two trees. 
the presence of the tree of life and the presence of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Now, the direct command comes at the end of the section we read where Adam can eat of any tree except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It says that the day he eats from it, he will die. The presence, I think, of these trees, the God's creation of these trees shows that from the moment of creation, we are not just physical beings and we are not just rational and emotional beings, but that we are also spiritual beings. Like from, from creation, this is a trait of what it means to be created in the image of God. God alone knows what's good and not good for man. And the presence of this tree was really to remind Adam that he was not his own God. God gave him this one one rule, one command. And I think part of that was just to remind Adam that somebody else was in charge. There's a creator who is above you and that you're responsible to. God, I think, has built principles into the universe. We, we know those, right? That gravity is a principle. I mean, what goes up must come down. Like God just sort of built that into the universe. We violate the principles of the universe at our own peril. A good example is parents who teach their children not to touch the stove, right? It's not because we are cruel and mean and just want to make up arbitrary rules. It's because when a child touches the stove, he comes away with a burned hand, right? It hurts. And it's painful and it's an injury. So parents start threatening their kids. They're warning them lovingly. God uh, does the same thing with Adam. He, for his own good, he tells him that he has to, when it comes to this tree, you have to make the right choice, right? You could injure yourself. You will kill yourself if you eat from that tree. And, and we may think it's cruel to keep this one thing out of his hands. That seems so unfair. But it's not like God hadn't made provision for Adam to eat anything in the world that he wanted. Literally anything in the world that he wanted. He could eat from any other trees, any of the other plants. He could eat any of it except this one. Moral responsibility undergirds all of life. And moral responsibility, moral accountability has consequences. When Adam sinned, the result was death. Now, this is confusing to us a little bit, and we'll get to this when we go into chapter 3 another time, but we know that Adam did not eat the fruit and drop over dead. And yet, there he was, dead. Immediately. Because in Scripture, death is not always death. Death is not just to, to cease to exist. Death is really about separation. Death is about being separated from God. And the process of physical death was begun. If Adam had been, had after we're eating the tree of knowledge of good and evil, if Adam had made his way next over to the tree of life, we've got to presume that he would have lived forever in that body, in his sin, even after the fall. We, we can kind of assume that because... Uh, God said we've got to close off the garden, kick them out of the garden, close it off so that they don't get to the tree of life. God removed that choice. Adam and Eve, they made their choice and since then death has dominated history. Since the fall, men are bound by sin and ultimately we answer to God for that sin and we do it by way of spiritual and even physical death. We cannot please God. We cannot come to Him apart from His grace. And where this kind of comes full circle is that in our accountability to God, we can be cut off from that relationship with God that He designed us for. I'll close with this. Um, there was a German theologian years ago. His name was uh, Friedrich Schleiermacher. Don't? It's okay. He was known as the father of Protestant liberalism. The, pro the father of liberal theology in Protestant churches. And he, his work has wrecked havoc 
in the church world for uh, over a hundred years. But the story is told that one day as an old man, he was sitting on a bench in a city park, and then a policeman who didn't know him, obviously, and thought he was some sort of vagrant, um, came over to him, he shook him, who are you? And Schleiermacher uh, sadly replied, I wish I knew. It, here's the thing, right? It, when we cut ourselves off from the historical truth that I think is revealed in Genesis 2, that's about who we are, that we're created for this relationship with God, that we're created to work for God, and that, and, and that we're created to ultimately be morally accountable to God. When we cut ourselves off from that truth, we don't really know who we are anymore. That was lived out in that theologian's life ultimately. But it's true of all of us. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. It's only through Jesus that we come to know who we are in relationship to who God is. It's it's why we were created. And it's how we're called to live. Let's pray. With our heads bowed and our eyes closed, I just want to take a minute before we pray. It's a struggle sometimes to, to try to live this way in relationship with God. Completely sold out to Him. You know, there are some things we can do that are helpful. One of those is to spend time in His Word and in prayer. Another is to spend time with God's people. When we don't spend time in His Word and we don't spend time with His people, I, I don't think it's fair to say we're in a close relationship with Him. And maybe that describes you. Well, maybe you've drifted from reading His Word regularly. Maybe you don't. You've drifted from God's people. You're not in close relationship. Well, it's going to be hard to stay in close relationship with your Creator and be who it is that He's created you to be. If that describes you, I'd love for you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you, and then I want to encourage you to renew those, to renew that time in God's Word, and to be intentional about the influences around you. Father, thank you for your word and for the things we learn about who we are and who you are. The, the relationship that you so desperately uh, desire for us to have with you. <coughs> the work that you call us to do for you and the accountability that ultimately we owe you. Help us to find our true selves in you. And only in you. Father, I pray that there's somebody who uh, maybe, maybe uh, doesn't even have a relationship with you. I pray that they would do that they would answer that call. And maybe there's some who have drifted away. Lord, I, I would pray that you would just renew that in them. Show your grace and mercy to them in a way that's undeniable. Then ultimately I'd love to spend some time and pray and walk, and walk back with them. Father, I pray that you would bless your word Thank you for the things it teaches us. In Jesus' name, amen.